Hi. I don't think I met you guys yet. Um, I'm Rama Gottfried. I'm a composer um, and... Mm, what You're a composer. I'm a composer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm here, to, I'm here to help you guys in your so quest actually, on spatial uh, audio. Rama was invited to a composer in residence when we um, built up the 350 loudspeaker array in our concert hall. So he was the first person to work as a composer on the wave field, combined wave field and ambisonics or whatever array. So he was spending a year with us in the research group and we've been working together. And so he was also here last year to give introductory lectures to patching SPAT with Max MSP and spatial audio in general, which he'll do also this year. Um, so there will be three <coughs> lectures, beginners level, intermediate level, and advanced level. So if you never ever have patched anything, you should go to the beginners class, then you can follow up the other ones. Anyway, yeah. so the idea of this rather short talk is, um, or was, or still is, um, <laughs> to talk about object-based object audio. Um, I have to admit it's a little bit improvised, but um, you know, improvisation is fun. Actually, it came from the idea we had a huge European project, and uh, it's becoming more important, which was called Orpheus, for object-based broadcasting for European leadership in next, genera next generation audio experiences. So just call it Orpheus. Um, but it was a very nice project uh, with very many partners or partner institutions. So we had BBC, we had IRCAM Institute of Broadcasting in Germany, uh, Bavarian Broadcast, BCOM, which is a research structure in France um, for audio and video, train of audio, Fraunhofer, so all the candidates which we know from many different projects, but what was really interesting is that then also Swedish radio joined us, <laughs> if it show up, and French radio. Um, so it's all about object-based audio for broadcast. Why is object-based audio interesting? So, object-based audio does not equal immersive audio. Object-based audio is just audio plus some metadata which you send. So metadata um, could be, so or the aim of the project was to develop and implement an end-to-end object-based media chain. So it's a huge shift in paradigm. So far, sound engineers been mixing in a studio and you present the final mix for whatever format. So you do a 5.1 mix and mastering and you present it to the audience. And you send it or you uh, put it on a disc or whatever. So object-based audio just gives you way more information. So you could think about giving a Pro Tools session or whatever you're using for mixing to the end user and then the device at the end user side is mixing to have the perfect mix or the best mix for the system, which means um, the problem we face normally is that we have many different devices nowadays. So binaural on cell phones, 5.1 stereo, television systems, VR, speaker domes, wave feed synthesis, and whatever. So it's very difficult, especially for broadcast, who should deliver it still in mono. Hey, it still exists. <laughs> Stereo, 5.1, maybe 7.1. And then it should be, of course, interactive. Everything has to be interactive <laughs> nowadays. So, which means you have to change the format because interactivity in a 5.1 mix is a little bit difficult. You can mute channel, right channel, or left channel, but mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so we're talking about personalization, about non-linear listening. Very often, so broadcasts want to provide you, you know, know that you have, you can mute 30 minutes or 45 minutes. But the radio show is one hour 20. And you could say, OK, I want to listen to this radio show in 45 minutes. And automatically, your device is putting some parts out of the show or speeding up the show or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what broadcast wants to do. So that's personalization, nonlinear listening, and metadata. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge we have. As I said, we have very different situations. So for example, when you listen to a radio show, you commute, you do not have um, noise canceling headphones, so you just want to have the voice clearer of the radio show, so you want to enhance the voice. The mix should stay the same. Or you're sitting in your home cinema system, oh, that's a nice room, um, or in the car or whatever. So the listening situation may vary 
over many devices and many situations. So nonlinear listening, so we have you know, all these online platforms where you step back and forth and whatever. Um, so you can increase a lot of things, or you can um, just swap languages, or uh, do a lot of neat things with um, object-based audio. So what we want to do in broadcast is we want to collect as much as metadata as possible, because a lot of data is getting lost during the production process, which you might want to in the archiving format. We want to enhance the data with content analysis. We want to get the data throughout the broadcast chain, and then we want to translate this data into some high-level interfaces. Actually, um, I could show you one interface which came out of the project. We've been listening to Répond from Pierre Boulez. And so we have an object-based mix of this piece. And you could listen to it in binary on your cell phone. And then you could select, OK, um, I want to change my perspective. I put myself in the position of the conductor. Well, later on, I would listen to the same piece, but I sit in the position of the harp. Uh, which makes it very interesting. So that's one kind of interactivity we can provide. But you need the metadata to do so, and you have to translate the metadata to do so. So, sorry for the stepping. Um, <clears throat> didn't see that there's automation. So we collect, we enhance, uh, which means we segment, we uh, divide into speech, music, um, speak identification, speech to text, fingerprint, genre, key, tempo that you can, you know, when you listen to sounds online and you want to listen to some kind of similar music, you can use descriptors, but it's very difficult to search a database with descriptors or whatever. But if you have additional metadata, then you can quickly search databases. And what's very important also in terms of production process, you can perfectly imagine, like for wave feed synthesis, we want to keep channels separate. So there is no mixing format here for wave field. I could render for the array, for this array here in this position, then I would have a 128 or whatever channel file. But it's way easier to say, OK, I want to render this tango, which you heard before. It's four sources with metadata, which gives you maybe the position, the orientation, some kinds of other data, like the activity of the instrument and whatever. Um, and then, as I said, um, we want to translate this into interfaces to provide additional information, especially in broadcast. So on your cell phone, while listening to Répond, you can learn about the piece, you can learn about Pierre Boulez, um, whatever. You can imagine whatever metadata. But what's most important for us is you can send different programming languages. So you can send an overdub. So I get a French radio show, but I want to listen to it in, in English. Um, so it's just, you know, you just select your main language, or you can have additional content. Um, or you can have different content versions, just you watching a football play, and you are for team A, and your wife, she's for team B. So you can listen to the same content, but with different <laughs> perspectives. Um, actually, there's this nice, um, very directive speaker array. Um, they use ultrasound speakers, so the audio spotlight, which was originally developed at MIT by Pompeo, I guess was his name. Um, so they have this very, very nice television where they put prism in front of the television so you can project with a normal television, two shows, depending on where you sit on your sofa. Mm. And then you have two times, so the content in different formats. So you could watch at the same time, I don't know, a football play and uh, whatever, serious or drama or whatever. Um, and then you steer with the speaker on the spot where the person is sitting. So you have two contents at the same time. So that's very nice with object-based audio that you can swap in between contents. And for us, important in spatial audio is you can change your perspective and your positions in space. And since you have all the information, it's up to your renderer locally, client side, to decide what's the best mapping to your speaker system or headphones or whatever. So um, we call it normal format agnostic delivery and scalable reproduction setup. Um, so it just means whatever you're listening to, we try to the decoder or your client renderer decides what's best for you or for your system. The problem with this approach is now imagine a sound engineer. Don't know if there are any sound engineers in here. So do you really want to give it away your mix? Mm. <laughs> um, and say, OK, I was doing a mix. 
uh, sort of preliminary mix, but then the device decides what's best. Um, so in terms of reverberation, distance rendering, depth, whatever. So that's a huge discussion with broadcast engineers. Um, so this is an open discussion. But anyway, we have very min many different formats. So object-based is just sending one sound source, would be a sound source, which has a position space, some attributes like orientation, space, and whatever. But also an audio scene can be an object. You can stream an ambisonic three-dimensional scene and say it's an object. Or you can be channel-based. 5.1 would be one object, which is defined as six channels, 5.1. And since it's a standardized format, you know the positions where the five channels should be played back. And if you play it back, for example, with the speaker dome, you would make five virtual sound sources, which correspond to the 5.1 setup, and play it back. So it's the renderer again, which decides which is the most efficient and best decoder. Then you could have enhanced loudness and dynamic control, or rendering, blah, 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 blah. So now we can imagine, especially in broadcasts, um, we are very limited in, in the number of channels. So it's a huge stream. So MPEG-H, the new 3D audio format, uh, would support 128 channels plus metadata. Um, if you talk to a broadcast engineer, um, I think they try to get 14 channels now. Um, 5.1 is the maximum so far, and they want to try to get 14 channels streamed over the air. So we are far away from 128. Um, but anyway, it's a first try. But we can use it actually for the different five formats. So we are using Broadcast Wave 64 um, together with ADM, which is called Audio Definition Model. So then we stream it over AES67, which is a meter format, which can talk to Dante, to um, AVB, and whatever. And what's important for us is, so I could put all the information in broadcast WAF, uh, WAF format. So I have, let's say, a 64-channel file, which is an ambisonic scene, which I define as an object. You get the file, and in the header information of your audio file is all the information you need. You don't have to contact me and say, oh, which encoder, which channel order, um, whatever you have to know about ambisonics to decode it. So you can also define trajectories which evolve over time. So you can move sound sources around and whatever. And everything is contained in the header information of your multi-channel audio format. So actually, although we've been working this broadcasting project uh, without being a broadcaster, for us, it's very interesting uh, format because everything is self-contained in the header information. Actually, we have a subversion of ADM, which just allows you to stream OEC messages in the header, uh, which Rama will maybe mention a little bit about object-based audio. So maybe just important, so there are two formats, actually. It's MPEG-H, which is standardized, and the Euro European Broadcasting Union is currently standardizing another um, uh, object-based format, which is called audio definition model. It's an open standard, which is quite nice. And so actually everything is embedded in the broadcast valve as an XML header, and um, which defines your object. So you have audio channels, which are regrouped in chunks, and those chunks have certain attributes and whatever. So it's about 100 pages to read, to understand ADM and whatever. Um, I think it's just important that you know that you have different channel types. So you have objects, you can have a binaural stream, you can have IO or ambisonics, you can have matrices and whatever. So you could imagine just to make a mix and you have a monitoring situation in your studio, uh, which works fine for you, and then you're not giving the mix which corresponds to your studio setup, but you give your session away or monthly channel stream with all the attributes that on the client side, if somebody is, let's say you, you're the lucky one, you have a 64 channel dome at home, um, working in your little studio, and then somebody receives it for his home cinema and wants to listen to 5.1. And actually, you need just an intelligent decoder which maps what the, the multi-channel stream format would get from you to this decoder, which is a big chance. But again, for a sound engineer, it's not so easy to say, hey, I. I'll add uh, an intelligent device to my final mastering. Um, 
Okay, so I don't want to go too deep into the structure. Um, we've been creating tools which are called ADM tools that you can record in ADM, that you can play back in ADM, and so on. So that's a student work, uh, which I just quickly present here. Um, actually, it's a nice project. It's, um, it's Danza with a camera. She's taking the camera and just walking around um, a group of, of jazz musicians. And actually, the, the picture should follow because it gives you this first-person perspective, which is quite nice. And so they've been mixing in the studio, and what you can see here, because all the metadata is in there, so the mix from the studio moves with the camera. Um, and now what I did here, I was just projecting what I get from the multi-channel file on the dome here. I didn't have time to listen to it. I hope it works, actually, <laughs> um, but we'll see. At least the video works. you get the idea. So what's nice here is that I reduced the video. Did you hear this from the Amazonics array? Oh, sorry? Did you hear this from the yeah, that's from the Amazonics array. So what I did is um, I didn't have time to set it up. So it was yesterday night. Um, I downloaded the, the, the file with the video. And then I just um, got in here the configuration file, which I configure. We cannot see it here, but you can imagine that's the speaker array from here. And then it's the decoder which decides how to match this best to this current situation. And if I would have another situation where I just say, okay, I'm not using this custom, I'm using standard like 5.1 or, or whatever format, um, it would remap. It's not that easy because then some questions appear. That's, that's quite easy going because you have uh, instruments around and you're just turning. So, that's a nice exercise, but just imagine that you have a 3D recording um, and you map it to a 5.1. What would you do with the center speaker up there or the sounds coming from, from up there? So should they go to all speakers or 
So we have very many open questions, which are more aesthetic questions or sound en or engine less engineering questions than um, decisions to make in an, in an art process. And I think there, that's why it's important to, to think about all these objects, and we'll see tomorrow with ambisonics and perspective with 3D microphone arrays, um, that we have to rethink the way we produce music. And that's, I think, very challenging, but also very interesting, in my opinion. And so here, we could quickly go to headphones and now render it over headphones um, with head tracking and whatever. The next huge question is, what should we do with reverberation? Mm -hmm. Um, because to get depth in a recording, we need reverberation. But should we stream only one channel and then decorrelate it, which sounds not very nicely? Um, should we use multiple channels in which format and whatever? So um, we're at the very beginning of a huge shift in paradigm again, um, because we have the technology which allows us to stream multi-channels. So before we have been asking the question, because stereo was the maximum we could broadcast. So. I don't ask myself the question, what should I broadcast when I can only use stereo? Uh, but now, since we get to multi-channel, um, it's getting very interesting. And now, I think in this video, it's quite nice because it shows the play with perspective, because it could be you changing the perspective. So here, it's just linked to the video, but it could be an interface for you just to walk around virtually in the orchestra. So um, that's a that's very beautiful application, actually, of what you can do. So that's a current topic, and which is also somehow linked to wave feed synthesis. That's why we blocked it af after wave feed synthesis uh, rendering, because that's object-based format. There is no associated recording technology for wave feed synthesis. So when I use ambisonics, which are very playback over a speaker dome, I use a spherical microphone array, which corresponds to the format. If I use 5.1, I have a tree of microphones, so 5.1. Um, wave feed synthesis, there is no, five, uh, no WFS recording technology. So I can pan or synthesize objects in space with some attributes, like position, directivity, and whatever, but I cannot record them like in a scene. Um, yes? For example, as a sound engineer, if I want to work with, I don't know, with these ideas, should I always go with coincidence microphone arrays and not anymore use like stereo techniques? Hmm. So what are the, what are the questions about that, that? That's actually a question because when you just imagine you do a traditional, uh, so an, an ambisonics recording, so you replace the 5.1 microphone by a sphere, uh, so an eigen mic or whatever. And then you still use spot microphones and you mix everything together. So this gives you, from the perspective of the microphone, a very nice mix. But when you then want to change the perspective, then you can't use the main microphone anymore because it's linked to a space. So um, we did some tests and with multi-microphones, so you hook up more than one eigenmics to get different spots in the room and then you can swap at least in between those spots. Um, and then you take the spot microphones and mix them to each spot, so you redistribute them in space. Um, but yeah, that's all the open questions we have. So the play, I think, with the introduction of 3D playback formats, the play with perspective is something which is a real challenge, and we'll hear tomorrow also pieces by Natasha Barrett, um, and she's doing recordings. Uh, she started with, with sound field microphones, but. She has this very nice composer's approach in playing around with perspective and sound, with recordings, so kind of sound mosaicing and whatever. And the result she gets, it's, it's really amazing. Um, so just to illustrate, and we'll hear it tomorrow as well, um, if I take a 3D microphone array and I'm talking and I put it close to myself and I project it with sphere, my voice becomes like a big voice over the entire dome. And if I move, let's say I record Rama drinking here, uh, making noise, so this will be like a granular sphere, like everywhere. And if I move away from him, he gets a point source in space. So my movement directly translates into what's happening on the playback situation. And so when you play as a sound engineer, as a composer, as an artist, or whatever, um, with this perspective, it's really beautiful. So just imagine you record percussions, and then you 
get some snare drums or some hi-hats and you put a 3D microphone under the hi-hat and then you get like a big bell but with the sound of a hi-hat. Um, so you can have this very beautiful play with perspective. Um, and then it's nice when you have, for example, you have a multi-channel recording and you do not only know that it's a sound field microphone, but you have some metadata description which explains you what's happening, that you can reinterpret uh, interpret, um, what you get as multi-channel file. Um, so I it's might a big jump, chance. Jump in on this idea of interpretation. For me, I think that's, as a composer, that's what's most interesting for me is, is how are things interpreted? How, are, how can um, the, um, how can you go from a, well, interpretation is interesting from a, from a performance perspective, that, that uh, interpretation is what takes a, an idea and, and performs it, right? So um, I like that the, the object-oriented audio approach is, a, is in a way kind of a score that gets performed by uh, the rendering system. And um, it's, I, I wasn't aware of the automatic, um, this work on the, the automatic um, rendering design. Um, because for me, I guess what I would usually, my perspective would usually be to take advantage of this format as a way of connecting um, the sort of the metadata, or I wouldn't even think of it as meta um, in a way like, like when you're thinking about object-oriented composition rather than object-oriented audio. So object-oriented composition is, for me, um, a, a large way of how I think I think about um, performance and, and, and including real humans and also um, with speaker systems as material objects that there's a sound that's moving through space, right? Or is existing spatially. And um, very often when we're composing with, with large scale systems, uh, it requires a lot of separating concerns of, of uh, production. So we have the spatial design, we have <clears throat> the sound design, uh, and the, um, uh, so, you know, spatial, sort of kind of abstracted spatial information. So where the sound should be in space, separate from the way it's rendered. So just the idea of a sound being over here, um, you know, regardless of how well we can actually render that. Um, and then uh, being able to, um, right, so often when we're working with large scale systems, um, uh, we have to define, you know, spend time defining how does, how does this thing move in space? And then we say, okay, what is the sound that's going into that? Or maybe we have a sound and we say, how does this sound move? Um, and these are two kind of unfortunately separated processes that, that end up being having to be developed sort of you know one step with one foot and then the other until you until they join together and an ideal situation for me would be something where we could make that that um those two different sides be more joined together and, and I'm sorry are you talking about like joining the metadata with the with the uh the thing it refers to or is meta Basically, yeah. So, I mean, basically, I, you know, I, I'm coming from a kind of um, uh, OSC perspective on this in some ways that, you know, we have a, a bundle of information. I'll, I'll talk about um, OSC um, in the patching sessions also, but um, basically the idea of a, of a bundle is also in, in networking and, and um, you know, that you have a packet of information that has some kind of identifier to what type of packet it is and what's in the packet, and all of this stuff is integrated together. And actually, AVB is sort of the similar idea that it's a, uh, you have um, audio, video, data. Um, I kind of, I feel like metadata to me seems like a term that means that it's somehow separate or it's like describing the thing. And I, I feel like the, data I'm talking about is not even meta, it's just part of the thing, you know? The way I'm, I'm seeing this as is a potential somewhere, somewhere down the line, I don't think it's probably ready yet 
for this kind of, or I think that the authoring environment doesn't completely exist yet to that where you could, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Marcus, um, but not I, completely. Could we swap back to my computer, please? Thanks. Uh, but I, I, I believe that, I mean, this is a challenge of how do you, how do you actually author this stuff? So how do you, so how could I take a sound that is, ah, we have, it's all already done, great. Uh, <laughs> so we, you have a sound, and let's say I want, I want a, a sound that, a, an object, a process that has a sharp attack, and as the attack decays, it curves around the room. And I'd like to define that as one gesture including the sound. Maybe this is already ready to be you know. I wouldn't say ready, but um, actually the aim of the project was working all together, so research institutions, broadcasters, software companies, in getting a workflow. So we wanted to work on a workflow for sound engineers, which uh, does work. And so the BBC in Manchester and also in London, they have this very nice um, IP studio, how they call it. Um, that's for production. So this was our chart for uh, what we wanted to work on. So we have recording, pre-production, mixing, the radio studio, which was the BBC studio, then the distribution and streaming um, over the different formats like MPEG-H, ADM, AAC, ADM. You can, you can write books about all these abbreviations. Um, I'm not a broadcaster, so I always have to look up the dash and the bash and the mesh and the whatever, but anyway. Um, the whole idea is that you have a pre-production mixing, recording, then you get go to the radio studio, prepare everything for being distributed or streamed over the network or broadcasted over the air. And then you get different applications like a mobile phone, like a web browser, like an AV receiver, or just a mix down to a monophonic radio stream um, with all the different formats being involved. So PCM audio, multi-channel audio files from the recording, which are then transformed into audio streams, so ADM or AAC streams over Dash. Then they streamed over the uh, network, and then you can get on the receiver side to a renderer. The recording can be straightforward or not, so using microphone arrays, using spot microphones. Um, there are all the questions which I just briefly mentioned come in. Um, all the questions about how to deal with perspective and whatever. So that's a whole story, but a big chance for sound engineers, in my opinion, because a stereo mix is something I can do at home. A multi-channel 3D mix, it's mostly often not something I can do at home. So it's a whole new era for sound engineers to gain experience and to work on this, um, which I think is beautiful. Um, so another question was the DAW, how to, to work with the DAW. So the pre-production mixing, um, we didn't have the tools, so you have to write plugins to deal with ADM and, and all these object-based formats um, in a proper way. To monitor at home might be over binaural or over 5.1 and whatever. And to use it properly with broadcast WAF. And then to get it into a 67 uh, stream. And then there was the BBC radio studio, the IP studio prototype, which is a really neat studio um, with a whole infrastructure for 7 plus 1 speakers. And then distribution of a network. So I'm not an expert on this. Um, that's the BBC's part and um, of the radio. And then on the reception, we've been working with small software companies, which, you know, they developed apps which you can download and, and you can receive the stream. Um, or in the web browser, so all the things which are currently going on is uh, web technology. So we have the open, uh, so the web audio standard, um, which is quite nice to make binary decoders or whatever you want to do over the audio. So just to show you one picture of the studio, so that's the EIP studio, uh, the Orpheus studio, which, you know, it's a standard studio. The only thing which changes everything is IP-based, and you still use a DAW, so digital audio workstation, but with other software tools. And as a final product, what you get is, um, so the idea was also to produce some teasers or pilot studies uh, which should be interactive and whatever. So this was part of the project. It was not only because we said when we defined the project, it's nice to work on the technology, but we have to produce content because without producing content, we will not learn how to produce the content, how to use the content, and does it make sense or not. And actually, so there were some tasters. 
in live streaming, there was a radio drama which was live streamed over the BBC website. And um, in August, maybe we um, have a project, maybe in September then, um, where we want to stream a recording, which I did in, in Vienna recently, um, where we have a piece by Olga Neuwitt with distributed musicians around the audience. Um, a lot of ambisonics going on over speaker dome, a lot of live electronics. And we want to stream this in an object-based format with the uh, Bavarian broadcast. And then, of course, um, so that's the interface of, of, of the web apps. But uh, Trinov was developing a hardware device, so a receiver, and so on. So it was more about getting this into practice. It's less fundamental research in there. Um, but it's a neat project to see if it works. So if you're interested in um, playing around with broadcast uh, with ADM, so all the tools, you'll find uh, all the tools for free at the IRCAM forum website, um, which help you to, to set up your environment in a way. So you work with the digital audio workstation. You have, for example, you stream your multi-channel audio tracks to the um, recorder, to ADM recorder, and all the position and metadata information so there's a plugin which sends OSC messages, which is called Tosca Tibus OSC application, or whatever. Um, <laughs> Pretty sure that's what it stands for. Yeah, it, it, T <laughs> stands for Tibo. Um, because we've been asking him and we're saying, hey, wouldn't it be nice <coughs> just because I normally run out of CPU power when I do spatial audio. So I just want to stream 192 tracks to a second computer with the position data. So he was writing this beautiful object, which transforms your automation tracks of the digital audio workstation in whatever you want to send. So you can say, my first three tracks are at some elevation distance, and you send this. Um, so you can define your workflow, and this is then recorded into this ADM recorder. And then you just can drag and drop it into the player or the renderer, which I've shown on the other computer before. And you get all the information for playing it back. So it's still work in progress. Um, so it's a prototype software, but it brings you closer to what's actually happening in broadcast nowadays. And I think it's a, it's a neat thing to, to experience, especially when you work with multi-channel audio files and, and 3D audio. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to show what's going on with object-based audio. So Rama, I don't know what you want to add. I have one question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Tosca is a VSD plugin. Um, so it's VSD AAX, or I don't know which formats he supports, but I guess all the formats. Um, so it's also for free. And it's really nice because you can define up to 32 automation tracks. Um, so you have a setup file, which is an XML file, where you say automation track one sends eight azimuth data, and you map, the, so you give the minimum maximum value. So, um, so you could set your ultimate elevation distance or rotation or whatever you want to have in an automatic stream. Um, of course, when you then go to ADM, that's a standardized format. Mm -hmm. So not everything is possible in ADM. Okay. Um, so you would, read this, would have to read the standard what's possible. You can send a bundle of up to 32, uh, up to 32 automation tracks per channel. per channel. But they all have the same setup, so the same structure. Okay. So you cannot say my first track sends optimal elevation distance on the first three automation tracks, and my second track, audio track, sends X, Y, Z. Um, that's not possible. So you have per session digital audio workstation, you have one setup file for Tosca which allows you to define 32 values in OSC um, for the automation tracks. Okay. And yeah, I guess the <clears throat> thing I might add um, is really just kind of gesturing towards the, what I think will eventually be the future way of working someday, which is, I know you were talking about Antiscofo, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm doing, working a lot with, with ODOT. Antiscofo is a anticipatory score following object. <laughs> Uh, that's been in development at AirCam for well, lots Ages. of many, 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 many years. Uh, and apparently is starting to work, which is cool. 
Um, I'm, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, the problem is it was a score follow. It's, so, a, it's um, a difficult thing. It was used like you have an instrument playing and it's automatically following the score, so you place the computer musician of <coughs> triggering cues. Um, but I'm not using it as a score follow, no. but there's a very beautiful language, which is script language. So for those of you who are patching a lot, so what I'm normally doing is I set up a very simple patch and all the messaging, which is pain in Max MSP, it's just a script language. And then I trigger a queue and all the messages come in as a stream and configure my patch for this queue and then you play the queue, right. uh, which is quite nice. And so I guess what I'm thinking about, what I would like to see someday in, in this idea of object is that is a bit more like this Q idea in in Antiscofo, where, I mean, you know, of course everybody uses DAWs, um, but I feel like the problem that I have with DAWs is that when you have a separate automation lane for every parameter, you're separating something that is actually a holistic thing into all of these different parameters. So, for instance, you have azimuth, elevation, distance, right, or X, Y, Z, but you have to address each one of these things differently. What I'm working on right now is a um, sort of a agnostic um, graphics, uh, graphic notation platform, which I hope will address some of these things, which is where you can design your own graphics um, and attach different uh, graphical symbolic information to OSC values, which would, could potentially act in the same way as a, as a DAW. So if you imagine, you know, on a score in traditional written um, notation, you might have uh, a note for an instrument that somehow is integrated with a symbol that, that, um, that describes some kind of spatial information. And for me, that's a, potentially could be a, um, a more holistic, a more perceptually coherent way of combining all of the spatial information into a more concise format that that creates the sort of unity with the the sound for me I mean this is totally a personal thing because of course once you've been working in a DAW for a long time maybe you know you get used to that working situation and you get fast and you can start to hear what it means to move the automation and maybe you can do it really fast but um, uh, what I mean is that, um, you know, if you were to imagine an object being like a, a sound object in the DAW as being a, like a, a sample of material and then, you know, however many automation lanes you have of all the different parameters, um, how do you then bring that object into relationship with other objects? And in a DAW, it's very linear. And I would hope that someday um, that we could have a more dynamic system, which I think Antiscofo is one example of going in this direction and, and kind of ODOT and, and this kind of more real-time perspective. And yes, so I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm just... So far it's more time-based, mm -hmm. um, but what's beautiful, just imagine that you do sound insulation art, and so far when we use whatever Super Collider, Max MSB, whatever you use for rendering, and you want to, let's say it's a 3D installation and you have a lot of sound movements. So when this should run for, let's say, four months. So you have to set up a patch, which is the software running on a computer. You know, some software running on a computer for four months, um, <laughs> you'll at least get a call once a day. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it should work better than once a day, but anyway. So if you could put all this information just in a multi, so you go to the spot, you rent it for the spot, you put all the movements as mm. metadata mm. into your broadcast WAV file, you can use a standard, let's say you have 64 channels, a standard 64 channel playback machine. It doesn't have to be a computer. And then you just have the little brick of software which interprets what's getting Exactly. and rendering the system. So right. unfortunately, we've been recently doing a nice sound installation also with Olga Neuwirth, which was running in the Pompidou Center. Uh, but we haven't been ready for um, the ADM format uh, at that time. And yes, so it was not every day, but twice a week the call um, that the Max patch crashed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is linked not to Max. I don't want to blame Max then having not enough time for proper programming and testing. Mm 
Um, but anyway, so it can help for a lot of things in sound insulation art. And since you have a lot of metadata, you can have different programs. Program means um, I can interpret the same audio tracks in a different way. So it can still be interactive. Although it's being played back, you can have a terminal pushing some buttons which change something in your installation art. So there is some kind of interactivity which, which is possible and it eases a lot of installations, in my opinion. Um, yeah. And you could, so just tying that back into what, what I was saying also is that with, I think, which could totally work is in this format, you could also in the metadata, you could include some scripts or something like that. And so you can actually, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on the sort of authoring environment problem of how do you think about these things and how do you compose them, but actually all that whole layer of activity is, is before you would actually then produce a kind of object oriented mm -hmm. file which then would contain all of this information, which then could be played either linearly or non-linearly. Um, and that's really, could be very powerful. So why we wanted to show this, because I think it's time that we need content, we need artists to get involved, we need people to work with it, to send bug reports, to send ideas, um, because it's all in the progress of standardization. And who's not yet speaking up, cannot complain afterwards that uh, it's not in the standard. Um, so if you get interested, I think a lot of information is on the Ophius website. Um, as I was saying, Tosca and ADM mix tools are for free. So feel free to download them and just to test them. There's a player, there's a recorder, there's a metadata. Um, on the Ophius website, you should find some pre-rendered radio plays or whatever just to get your 5.1 or binaural system set up and just listen to them and see if it works on, on your computer or not. Um, it's all prototypes. It's not yet a real production environment, but it's quite a lot of fun um, to use those tools. And if you use them, please get somehow involved and send bug reports and ideas and whatever. So this, this idea of scalability is something that, that I talk about a lot. I do sound installation in one museum, and then I take it to another hmm? museum that has different architectural parameters. I have to scale it. And and that scaling, if I do something like there's a swallow flying around the room, when the swallow reaches the ceiling at the corner, then a thing happens in another place. Mm -hmm. But if the room is scaled to a different size, the time difference, if it's a dissociated object from object A and object B, is going to be different because the room is different. So if the room scales along this way, swallow takes this amount of time to get here, those objects don't talk to one. If there's not metadata that's talking across objects to see a relational value, like Ram is suggesting, then the scalability doesn't matter because there's a time domain problem that... that uh, it depends on which way. level you see the scalability. If you say it's an angular movement in time, then um, your sound just moves faster. Right. Yeah. So, Right. That, so both that's, that's, that's both the problems, but yeah. that's exactly the problems we face. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I'm curious what the, what the current, what from, from your side of things, that you think the current state of the art in, in sort of trajectory writing is, because like, like my lab has been doing these things that are not working particularly well, like a one to 10 model with a, with a wand from an HPC Vive where we define a space on a table and we draw in the air the trajectory and that maps to the trajectory in the physical room at the full mm. size, and it's super messy. And then you end up doing it with three lanes of automation data in a DAW, and all of a sudden you're back in breakpoint editor land, mm -hmm. and it's not visually we, illustrative of what you're we doing. We are very in. much in, I like the term breakpoint uh, the editor land. <laughs> uh, we are still there. Um, there are some computer aided composition tools like Open Music. Yeah. Um, where we recently created, which is called Open Music Spot. So all the Spot library is getting into Open Music. Um, so it's not, it's also still work in progress, but it's, it's uh, working quite well. So Thibaut Carpentier is working together with Jean Bresson to get this up and running. And what's quite nice, because when you get very complex, so you can render in wave feed synthesis, you can render in ambisonics, you can render in your speaker feeds and whatever. So you just get your multi-channel audio track and then the idea would be also to integrate the automation data. Um, so far, it's still drawing trajectories or doing some algorithms which stream actually automation data in there. Um, but the, the, the ordering is still a huge problem, in my opinion. Yeah. So I was using, I was starting to use Blender 
to mm -hmm. do some kind of ordering like in, in animation. <clears throat> um, so Blend is quite nice because you can Python script, so you can get the data easily out as OSC messages. But it's still, yeah, moving sound sources around and whatever. I personally do not have this problem very often because I'm more mixed music life, real time. So it's more the problem how to set your controls up <laughs> to um, get the things up and running. Um, but yeah, also the control, live control of spatial audio, it's still a huge problem. So you end up with doing like a fader is doing some strange movements or whatever. Um, but yeah, there is still a lot of work on the interfacing technology, ordering technology, and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Is there anything or anyone working on converting uh, OSC specialization data into audio and back? Mm. Which means, sorry. Like, say, are you, I mean, like using data as audio and audio as data is a classic trick of modular synthesizers, right? Because you have main jack everywhere. Um, so is anyone using audio and Messages. Is there audio rate data? Or like in you, you, you can record it as audio rate. Um, the question is really if you want to do it. Um, because does it make sense to have 44 or 48K contour messages a second? You can down, I mean, I'm not opposed to downsampling stuff. I'm just curious if there's any type of data mangling that kind of plays between the formats. Um, there are some tools, yes. Um, but here the approach is more that you put it into the WAV file, um, but it's me metadata, which can be time-based. So you can put them on the, you know, after five seconds, track trajectories are changing. You can even swap channels and whatever, so it's a very open format. Um, so I'm, yeah, you can record. Uh, there are some recorders um, which transform it into audio data. But I'm never using such things because I have mainly the problem my projects normally exceed 128 channels and I don't want to have some more audio channels no. um, because it's already a problem facing with those channels. Um, but yes, it exists. I would maybe interject there that I think that, I mean, the benefit of the audio clock is that it's very synchronized, right? It's very accurate in time. Um, but it doesn't mean that, um, you know, control rate messages can be synchronized with the, the audio clocks also. So just because it's not in quote unquote audio doesn't mean that it's not well synchronized. It's possible. I'm not concerned in synchronization. I'm more interested in having audio tracks that spatialize themselves and listening to it. Well, I think that's kind yeah, of the that's, idea. Yeah, but that's the, the metadata. That's, that's the idea. So you just put it yeah. in the XML header. Yeah. So you don't need any additional information. Everything which you, know, which you have to know about your multi-channel audio file, it's in there. And you can even have groups, so you can embed. You can say, I have nine channels, which is an ambisonics format. Um, and then you have some objects which move around in space. It's all automatic. So it's all in the header information. Um, that's the whole idea, actually, without putting it as a, as a WAF file. Yeah. Is, it, is it storing time? Uh, no, it's time points. That's one, one problem when you use a stream. Yeah. So when it's streamed, so currently the ADM standard gets uh, standardized for as a streaming format yeah. because that's very different than when you get the entire track and you can read the head information. Mm -hmm. I just imagine a scenario where if you have a sampler and you're triggering samples and each sample has a sound file and you're constantly midstream changing what the header file is, you're going to run into a bunch of... Uh, Problems with the scalability, but. Yeah, but it's, it's quite well working, actually. It's just currently what's not solved is when you have a stream and you jump in in the middle of the stream. Ah, sure. yeah. Because you then you miss a lot of information because, um, yeah, so that's not yet solved. Yes, please. It's kind of, kind of a theoretical question in the beginning when you, know, you, you talk about this opposition between object, uh, object based uh, and immersive. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are there, is there some idea of maybe of building in perceptual models into the metadata, like for instance, information about a space, you know? You, you, could, uh, you, could, you could put such, so you can put whatever metadata you want to have. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's always there is some metadata which is standardized that every decoder which is ADM certified can interpret the information. If it's for your own personal projects, you can put whatever you want to put in there. Um, it's just if it's not standardized, somebody else who is reading a file will not be able to interpret. Even the standard says there is some open fields, which is your personal metadata. Um, so yes, you can put information about the room. So that's what the BBC is actually doing. Um, there's a lot of information where it was recording GPS data and whatever. Everything they need for archiving, um, that in 10 years, what, whatever, you get just a sound file and say, oh yeah, this was the radio show, it was recording by Mr. X and um, whatever. So they try um, actually also the scripts and everything should go in there so that you have a self-contained format which gets as much as possible uh, of information in there. Yes, the train of box. Yeah, so are we talking about the future that we are getting rid of the computers? All the ADC, DAC is happening in that we'll box, and we are just that's uh, connecting all the speakers with speaker wires and not XLRs, and we are using these very consumer based speakers. I think we're mm -hmm. not getting rid of computers, but it will be more a thing embedded, like an appliance. Than, yeah than a computer, so that's what's happening actually. That's what's happening with a cell phone. You call it cell phone, but it's a computer. Um, because it's dedicated to be a phone, but most of the things, so if you take the time which you spend on the phone as a phone, mm -hmm. I think it's most texting, internet surfing, um, whatever. But so, I'm, you know, right now we have all the choices of uh, which EAC converter that I want to use, which speaker array that I want to use, or which like even cabling protocol that I want to use in this like building those installations, right? Are I think you standardizing all those stuff. You'll no. I think you'll have the choice like you have nowadays. You buy a television, mm -hmm. and you get a set top box, which doesn't give you any choice. So you get what's in the set top box or you get it more flexible um, in terms of output formats and whatever. So I think you, you will have maybe the standard products, the premium products, the Sound Engineers Pro Audio products, which give you all flexibilities. Um, I think the market will just go with it. But, but this will be available for kind of consumers. Uh, that's, I think, a consumer product. So that's a study for a consumer product, but I'm pretty much sure that they will put it on the market yeah. as soon as the ADM is established. Um, but it will be also MPEG-H compatible. And because, you know, it's always with formats. Um, you don't know which format will survive. So mm. MPEG-H takes a ADM as well as input format. Um, but we'll see. So the European Broadcasting Union is more for an open standard. Um, so Ampagage is a closed standard. So we'll see. Hmm. Is there a metadata compatible uh, 360 video metadata of this camera? Um, I don't know. <laughs> because the Actually. new record, the yeah. So you could... You could embed it as an ambisonics, yes. So here, when you record it, you could embed it as an object, which is an ambisonics first order, um, which is then defined by the orientation or whatever. That's that's compatible, yes. It's, it's the same standard. It's, it's the same standard. So we, I, we inject the metadata. There is just nothing. So ADM is an audio format, so there's nothing about video in there. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you could put the positional uh, information so that we need, I don't know if there are some gyroscopes in there or whatever. Um, so... No, there's actually two cameras and the new one, it has two microphones. Mm -hmm. So when I record, I, the person is over there and the other person is on this side. But I did a lot of edit works because these cameras didn't have it. So, mm -hmm. they do. so I guess it's, it's the same metadata for both those yeah. videos. Yeah, so it should be possible. Other questions? No more questions.
Well, last question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be the so, law. I mean, how long do you think this will take to digest, you know, and become more ubiquitous? Um, that's a very good question. So my personal story is that I developed a binaural headphone on a DSP platform for a headphone company, I would not say which one, in 2000. And it was ready for the market, and uh, marketing people said nobody needs this. Um, now, 2015, all these startup companies popped up, and the company I was developing for doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I don't know. It's like with all the formats, if you ask me the question, if I would say Dante will survive for AVB or whatever, I have no clue. Um, I'm pretty much sure that MPEG H, um, it's widely spread out yet, um, which is the same as, as, as AD, not the same in, in terms of format, but the same idea of object based audio. Um, so I'm pretty much sure that MPEG H will be seen in many devices very soon, because it already starts that you have MPEG H compatible devices. Then is the question. Actually, there was a, was a marketing study, um, how many people have 5.1 at home? Not so many. Um, but with binaural, it's the whole different story. So MPEG age becomes very interesting for, for binaural. Mm -hmm. And so broad, since broadcast companies searching for not new markets, but new experience for their users, I think it will go quite fast. I would say within the next five years, you will have many products which, which support MPEG age and object-based audio. It's a guess. Yeah, but thanks. Uh, very last question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for the attention. And um, I don't know what the next program point is actually. Uh, me either. But you should know, you have to program <laughs> somewhere. Um. <clears throat> <laughs>